Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have presented the gentleman on my right, Mr. Richmond Lawrence, twice before on our adventure series. Mr. Lawrence served for two years as the photographer for the Victor von Hagen expedition to Peru. In this capacity, he took us recently on a search for the Awarunya headhunters in the land of the Incas. Then in his second appearance, he showed us the giants in the sand, the enormous riddles of the Peruvian desert. Tonight, Mr. Lawrence will show us the actual films of the third and the most important objective of this von Hagen expedition, the incredible Highway of the Sun, a highway which ironically brought about the death of a great civilization. In the next 30 minutes, we turn back the hands of the clock as the present meets the past on the Highway of the Sun. Bold Journey, your television passport to the exciting, colorful world of adventure. And now, here to begin tonight's true story adventure is Jack Douglas. In the year 1533, a young soldier of Spain, Pedro Chiesa de Leon, made his way into Peru with the troops of Pizarro. Along the road, he was moved to describe, and we quote, the grandest in all the world. Now, this young soldier wasn't stretching the truth, for this was the magnificent Highway of the Sun, a fantastic 10,000-mile system of roads built by the Incas. Now, with this highway, the Incas were able to dominate one-fourth of the vast South American continent. And when the Spanish conquerors came, with their horses and heavy armor and short rations, they used this ready-made transportation line to find and conquer the Incas, ironically. After the conquest, the jungle, the rain, and sand quickly claimed the great highway. And not until four centuries later did a group of American explorers succeed in retracing the magnificent highway of the sun. Here now is the official photographer of the Von Hagen expedition, Mr. Richmond Lawrence of Hilton, New York. Hello, Mr. Lawrence. Welcome back to our program series. Now, this is your third appearance on our program, and in each instance, we've kept mentioning the name of Victor von Hagen or the von Hagen expedition. I think it would be quite proper if you would tell us about this leader of your expedition, Victor von Hagen. Well, Mr. von Hagen is an American, a writer, explorer. He has worked in Mexico, Guatemala, Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands, and finally in Peru. His... Uh, most recent expedition is fully covered in the book, The Highway of the Sun. Now, was I correct in stating earlier, Mr. Lawrence, that the exploration of this 10,000-mile Inca highway was the real objective of your expedition? Well, Jack, I can only quote the great explorer, Von Humboldt, who said, the Inca highway system is the most stupendous and useful work ever created by man. It tied in with Mr. Von Hagen's interest in Peru. At various times, he had seen pieces of the highway, and he wanted to put together this jigsaw puzzle. Now, how did you get this glamorous job of yours of, uh, as the photographer for the expedition? Had you known Mr. Von Hagen prior to that time? No, I hadn't. I was at USC at the time, and Mr. Von Hagen contacted Dr. Weckler of anthropology. He put me in touch with Mr. Von Hagen, and we were in business. I see. Well, now, this highway, 10,000 miles, as we have stated, how much of that do you feel that your expedition explored, approximately? Well, Jack, here's a map of the Inca highway system. We probably explored about 8,000 miles of it, Jack. It actually runs from Quito to Santiago. We explored the Peruvian section. We were happy to get in Peru, uh, to land at Callao, the port of Lima, and at last be on our way in the field. Victor von Hagen, the director of the expedition, the archaeologist, the cartographer, all of us were there on the docks just eager to get started. We just couldn't wait until all the equipment came off the boats that would last us for two full years in Peru. Fortunately, the Army gave us access to the secret maps of the country, which were a big help in locating changes in the roads that had taken place since the wheel vehicles had come in. I imagine they were rather pleased to have you conduct such a worthwhile expedition. Yes, actually it tied in with some of the things that they were doing. Final phase, the loading up, where even I had to shoulder a bag and do a little bit of work. <laughs> Beret Lawrence, eh? Beret Lawrence is right. 
But once everything was set, we just couldn't wait to get out, and we found ourselves in a world of sand, with fingernails of sand biting at us at all hours of the day and night, in our food, in our beds, in our water, even in our gas tanks. Meeting natives along the way was one of our big objectives, Jack, because they talked to us, they gave us all sorts of information around the local places. They directed us to this area that had been pawed over by all sorts of treasure hunters over a period of perhaps a hundred years. They'd uh, take what they wanted and leave behind what didn't have any value. That's why then these uh, little pieces of pottery are out on the surface. They've been previously dug up by treasure hunters. Yes, that's right. Part of our technique was to climb every hill to see if, by the binoculars, we could see any connection from one ruin to another. Because actually, there must have been trade between these peoples, Jack. You can understand that. Surely. So that's the logical place for a road to be. We found this ruin in one small valley where there was a little bit of irrigation. The modern irrigation had been put in there right over the irrigation of the previous people that had lived there. The pottery and the skulls and the bones were all some indication of how the people had lived. We tried to live there too, but we had dehydrated food and Victor loved to cook. We had a little bit better than the other people who had lived there. At our camp meals, we always talked over things we had seen during the course of the day, and everybody put in their own five cents, and it was all listened to and formed the plan for the next day's journey. Our next place we encountered was really a mammoth pyramid that had been originally used by a fortress. It was an outpost of the Chimu civilization which had antedated the Incas, but was finally conquered by them. An important protection for that particular empire. This might have been an Inca road, we don't know. There was nothing to identify it. This chap reluctantly told us where there was a pillar buried in the sand. We dug the thing up, and again, it was this Chamu people who ruled the whole north coast. The uh, figures in adobe had stood up over a thousand years uh, because of the absence of rain in that area. At an hacienda where they grew sugar cane, a horseman who was uh, a supervisor told us to go up the valley. And by following a primitive road, we found Inca stonework put together without mortar. Here was a beautiful lintel as part of an archway. We cut the area up and really searched because we knew we should find something here. And we were fortunate. From a hilltop, we saw a stretch of road, which we could definitely identify as Inca. It fitted all the descriptions. Our first stretch of Inca Highway. Here are the side walls made of stone, marking out the path through the desert. Well, that actually is in magnificent condition. That's right, but then it gets lost. So we had to make a detour and find it again. Strangely enough, we found that the modern highway, the Inca Road, and the railroad all ran together here. In this particular stretch, of In course. this particular mm -hmm. stretch, that's right. We identified it as Inca from the adobe. We'd found one characteristic that was very interesting. Whenever possible, the Inca Road went between two given places in a straight line. So we started taking compass readings. And then we were happy to find that by following these compass readings, whenever the road gave out, we could pick it up again by making a detour Following the compass bearing, we could pick it up on the far side. If it ran out in a cultivated field or in the big dunes that lined the coast by the sea, covered with these weeds, then we would take to the air. We found an hacienda who had crop dusters. We borrowed a plane from him to look over the Inca road from the air. And, and is that actually the Inca highway that we see there? That's actually the Inca highway running through through the sands for miles on end and finally crossing the present day highway. This proved the point that we had thought it might. The Inca Road, even in long distance, had a directional straightness to it. A compass point would carry us from one place to another. Even if we wound up in these terrific dunes, 10 feet deep, the impossible to drive a truck over, we'd just make a slight detour, get around it, pick up our compass point, and we'd be on our way again. That wide ceremonial road that we just came in on led to Chan Chan. This was the capital of the Chimu Empire, which was eventually conquered by the Incas. These people are noted for their artwork. Their adobe ruins are decorated with animal figures which have existed through the centuries because there's no rain on the coast whatsoever. 
something they tell us down there is it hasn't rained in 25 years, and they'll tell this every year. These people were workers in gold, they were workers in copper, they were workers in silver, they had a huge smelter. Millions of dollars in gold have been actually taken out of this particular site. With a population greater than London in 1450 or something like that, now the whole city is nothing but a nesting place for wasps. They had reservoirs which stored the water which came down periodically throughout the year. Farther down the coast near Lima, we found a reconstruction of typical Inca building. This had been put there for the tourists, but it is also very interesting to show what the Inca buildings on the coast probably looked like. The tourists had picked off little pieces of the plaster that had covered these stone walls. And some of them had even put their little marks there. Uh, Kilroy was here. This, of course, was sickening to us. The Incas were afraid of water, Jack, terrifically afraid of water. The streams rushed down 50 miles or so from the high Andes. In this terrific rush, at just one time of year, it will wash out everything before it. So the Incas built their roads high up on the cliff, above the high water mark so that the roads would not be cut off. The Incas utilized the water, though, in irrigation ditches. And many areas through here had irrigation, which is still in use today. Now the ditches are lined with concrete, but they're still in use. Now we're into a different section of the country, farther down the coast, the Graveyard of Kings. It's known as a necropolis, a city of the dead. We find the guardian, and because we have the authorization of the Peruvian government, he sets out with us to uh, show us the right spots to dig and to help us locate a mummy. On a bleak sand hill overlooking the bay, we find the few depressions which indicate that there's probably something underneath. The long iron probe that you see there will be used to test the ground underneath. We wanted to find some of the tremendous artwork of these buried peoples because naturally they put everything in their graves that was of value to the king. Jack, we knew we had made a discovery. After digging in the Peruvian sands for many hours, Jack, we knew that we'd found the tomb of a Peruvian king. The side walls were still in place but the roof had caved in. That's why there's so much dirt and dust around. Well, now, how did you uh, know that this was the tomb of a king? Why not the tomb of just an Inca peasant? Because of the size of the tomb and the location. No peasants were ever buried in this area. All of the tombs that had ever been discovered in this area had household pottery, the very finely decorated fabrics, some golden objects, even members of the household and their pet animals buried with the king. Right here, are we actually seeing the mummy of one of the ancient Peruvians? That's right. It's wrapped in very rough cloth that looks like burlap. Well, then I think at this point we should remind our audience, Mr. Lawrence, that you are working here under complete authorization of the Peruvian government. No one digs anywhere in Peru without authorization. We're now coming to Chala, a little bay overlooking the Pacific Ocean. According to Garcilaso de la Vega, this was an important stop on the Inca Highway, but Garcilaso only listed the tampus. He didn't say what was there. We wanted to study the place and find out why it was important, what it had to do with the Incas, what purpose it served, how it fitted into their pattern of things. There were many houses here, but there were far more storage areas. There were bones from practically a cross-section of all Peru. There were fabrics from practically of all Peru. There were even bones of Spaniards here and Spanish artifacts. From this we knew that the place had been in use for a long time and by a wide variety of peoples as a stopping place and as a supply place for the Inca troops that traveled over the road at this point. While the archeologists were working, digging out this material, I wandered off and found a flight of steps beside the ocean. By following the steps inland, I found a road which headed directly towards the mountains. This might have been 
the long lost road to Cusco that the runners had carried fish to the Inca 200 miles in two days. Von Hagen gave a toast on hearing the news and immediately got in contact with civilization to have a plane come down later. We dressed men in Inca costume and tested them out on the roads of the Incas. They were supposed to have gone 1,200 miles in five days. We checked them with a stopwatch. Over 10 miles, they averaged a six-minute mile, up and down hills, stone steps, and these were untrained runners. By this time, our plane had gotten there. We flagged him and directed him to a place to land on the hard-packed sand of the coast, consulted the maps, and then took off to see if we could follow that road upwards. We saw stretches of it until finally we came to snow. This indeed was the long lost road. Back on the ground, we got in the truck and drove up through a narrow canyon up to 16,000 foot, which was the pass into the mountain area. You must realize, Jack, that practically all of this mountain area is an average of 10,000 feet elevation, say around two miles up in the air. By talking with the people, we found a stretch of road that is still used by the sheep and the yamas. It caused a little traffic problem. There were no traffic cops around. It must have been rather refreshing to meet human beings after all that Peruvian wasteland. Gosh, that's rugged terrain. Here's a little bit more of rugged terrain. This was Inca Road, but the erosion, the tremendous water that comes to the mountains had just taken the surface off. Here we have the little girls. These are relatively wealthy and live in a little stone hut to protect them from the cold winds. A stretch of Inca steps. Since they didn't have the wheel, they had steps in the road. And up on top, we found the city of Tunanmarca. Literally hundreds of stone igloos, just like the girls in the valley were living in today. Sylvia crawled through one of the holes where it caved in. Many of the roofs were gone, but it was still very interesting to try and figure out how people had lived up here where there was no possible means of growing anything. Speaking of rough roads, Jack, this had caved in. We had to make a detour. A little farther on, a truck blocked the road. These are one-way highways through here. If a truck breaks down, you must make a thousand-mile detour or just make camp beside the road until they get the truck fixed. Another feature up in the mountains is the swift rivers crossed by hanging bridges. These were first put up by the Incas and have been renewed every year. The enormous bridges crossing some of the chasms were in use up until 1850. We wanted to get across to find mules because from here on in, we would be mule back. We were told to go to this hacienda and fortunately we found a man who spoke Quechua. He had Quechua speaking natives working for him. These people travel the trails all the time and by a combination of Quechua, Spanish, English, we got the information we wanted out of them. And we got our mules. It seems that the Incas wanted to put everything up on top of a hill. One of the first places we found was a valley and in the middle of the valley was an altar. A carved stone with steps in it broken in the middle. Was it discarded after it had been carved because it was broken and couldn't be used? And what did these strange carvings in the top of it mean? There was another stone that had a complete map of a city carved in relief. Here were buildings, here were streets, here were water courses. What could it possibly mean? Was this the plan for a city that was never built? It was definitely in your mind, however, a map of some future city. Some future city was the best explanation we could think of for it. And now we're at the geographical heart of the Inca Empire and the Temple of the Sun. Originally, this was all covered with hammered gold. The seat of the Inca was covered with gold. And this all went to the ransom of Atahualpa, only to have a noose put around his neck. The folkways of the Inca, the steps, the narrow roads through the mountain passes, are still used by the people today. This particular road led us over the mountain passes to the jungle area, a gate where the Inca collected toll and kept track of all the people who had passed through. And then we were in a saddle overlooking a jungle river. You wouldn't believe it, Jack, but there are steps, stone steps beneath their feet, all covered with the vegetation. There had originally been a rope here of woven maguey, 
put up by the Inca. Under our feet, we could feel the stones even though we couldn't see them. Here was a stretch where we could actually see some of the stone work. And now we were on top, which was a highlight for us and for anyone who goes to Peru, because here we have Machu Picchu, the refuge of the sun virgins. This is no doubt the biggest and perhaps best known of all of the Inca ruins, is it not, Mr. Lawrence? Yes, and by far the best preserved, because it was never known to the Spaniards. It wasn't known to civilization at all until 1911, when Hiram Bingham got talking to a chance traveler, just as we have done all through the picture. The man said there is stonework up on the mounds. Hiram went up to look, and he found this magnificent city. The characteristic roof ties, the windows in the Inca shape, and the views of the fantastic mountain scenery, the Intahuaytana, the hitching place of the sun, where the priest told the people that they would stay the sun on its northward journey. This, of course, conveniently happened at the Solstice. Then backward views of the city in its fabulous setting. There was only one road into the city, Jack, just one road and we went out on it. It's covered with vegetation now, so that it can hardly be seen. Well now, Mr. Lawrence, is this actually a part of the Inca Highway right here? Yes, this is very definitely a part of the Inca Highway system. We cleaned off the road because we wanted to follow it wherever it led. There were still many miles of Inca Highway to be found and explored. For us, the road builders had walked the road again, the Royal Road of the Incas, the Highway of the Sun. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawrence. It's quite easy, I think, for all of us now to understand why the Spanish under Pizarro were able to conquer the Incas with the ease that they did. I wonder, however, what kind of a time Pizarro would have had had it not been for the Inca highway system. What do you think? I think he'd had a great deal of trouble fighting his way through sand and through the rugged Andes, which exist in the mountains where the Incas were. It might very well have been impossible for the conquest of Peru ever to have taken place. That's just a purely personal opinion, however, on my part. Well, now, Mr. Lawrence, I think perhaps we ought to clarify the quotation of von Humboldt, which you gave us a little sooner. We don't want to get into a letter-writing controversy with our audience out there, and I'm afraid we may hear about that quotation. Well, the key word of the quotation, Jack, was useful. The Inca highway system was useful. The other wonders of the world, well, you have the lighthouse at Alexandria, that was useful. But the pyramids, they were just tombs for kings. Surely. Well, now, besides proving that the Inca, Incas were great engineers, what else do you think the Inca highway system really accomplished? Well, we not only verified the workings of the Inca highway road system and their system of couriers, with their fabulous runs. But we also uncovered various evidences of other civilizations dating back some 1,200 years. Even predating, in other words, the Inca civilization. Oh, by far, yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lawrence, I very much want to thank you for the three appearances you've made on our program. One thing that stands out in my mind at least, and I'm sure with our audience as well, is that each one of these three appearances of yours has brought us a film that has taught us something, and in the process has entertained us vastly. I want to thank you very much, and I hope you'll extend our deepest thanks and appreciation to Mr. and Mrs. Victor Von Hagen. Thank you again, Mr. Richmond Lawrence of Hilton, New York. In a moment later...